Good afternoon. My name is Jack Weston and, as you can see from the title of this webinar, my presentation to you today concerns property owner and manager liability for the independent criminal acts of third parties on the premises. This presentation is designed to dovetail with the other premises liability webinars presented over the past several weeks by our firm. At the outset, one needs to define what constitutes an independent criminal act. Simply put, these are the unforeseeable acts of third parties committed against invitees on the premises. The third party can be a tenant, a visitor, or even a trespasser. If, however, an employee of the property owner or manager commits the acts, other considerations may arise, which are outside the scope of my presentation today. I believe it would be prudent to initially review the respective duties owed the various types of individuals found upon the property. There are really three categories of people coming on the property. They are, in order of most to least duty owed, invitees, licensees, and trespassers. Invitees are those entering upon the premises at the express or implied invitation of the owner. They are either members of the public entering for a purpose for which the land is held open, or entering for a purpose connected with the business or other interests of the landowner or occupier. Invitees can include business customers, visitors, and guests. It's important to note that in Michigan, visitors or tenants to an apartment complex are considered invitees and not licensees. This is because Michigan courts have determined that part of the rent paid to the landlord or landowner is consideration for giving the tenants the right to invite others onto the property. This distinction is clearly set forth in a number of Michigan cases, most notably Stanley v. Town Square Cooperative, 203 Mishap 143, a 1994 case, which I shall discuss in more detail shortly. Generally, as regards invitees, and as set forth by the Michigan Supreme Court back in 1984 in Bertrand v. Allen Ford, the landowner has a duty to inspect, warn, and protect or make safe from the unreasonable risk of harm caused by a dangerous condition they know, or should have known, invitees would not discover, realize, or protect themselves against. However, in the context of third-party crime, as you will note when I discuss the progression of case law on that issue, this duty has been significantly modified, especially as it pertains to whether these types of acts are to be considered foreseeable. The second category of individuals entering on the land are licensees. Licensees are generally social guests, but could include anyone entering the landowner's property for the licensee's own purpose or business, with either the express or implied permission of the landowner. As noted previously, while one would ordinarily think that a guest of a tenant in an apartment complex who is a social guest entering the property for his or her own purpose, for example to visit the tenant, would therefore be a licensee. Michigan case law has modified their standing however, and regards them as invitees and not licensees. The duties owed licensees are somewhat diminished from those owed invitees. Generally, while the landowner does have a duty to warn licensees of known, dangerous, or concealed conditions, the landlord has no duty to inspect the property for these defects or to repair them. The third category of persons entering on land are trespassers. A trespasser is one who comes on the land without either the invitation or privilege to do so. There is no duty of care owed to a basic trespasser suing for negligence because the trespass is unforeseeable. Furthermore, the landowner has no duty to inspect the property for the presence of trespassers. There are subcategories of trespassers such as known, discovered, anticipated, and infant trespassers where the duty is somewhat modified. However, that's outside the scope of my presentation today. Can a duty be statutorily modified? The short answer is yes. It is possible to statutorily modify the duties owed to those who enter on the land because the legislature is freely empowered to modify duties by statute. Some confusion arises, however, concerning ordinances. Ordinances, as opposed to statutes, create no duty whatsoever. This has been long held by the Michigan Court of Appeals as exemplified by Johnson v. Davis, a 1986 case, and Ward v. Frank's Nursery and Crafts, Inc., a 1990 case. There's a caveat, however, under the Landlord-Tenant Act, which is covered under Michigan Compiled Laws 554139, often called the Woodbury Exception, after the case of Woodbury v. Bruckner. This case stands for the proposition that, if properly pled by a plaintiff who is a tenant, 
the landlord loses the open and obvious defense where the plaintiff has pled a breach of the duty to repair under the Landlord-Tenant Act. This, however, only applies to tenants and has not been extended to invitees such as guests. As you may have discerned from my discussion of duty, the foreseeability of the risk plays a pivotal role in establishing a duty. As you will see, this distinction is even more important in the realm of third-party crime. I will now move to a discussion of the evolution of landowner duty in the courts as it relates to the independent criminal acts of third parties. Sampson v. Saginaw Professional Building is a case involving an employee of a tenant of an office building who brought an action against the landlord of the building for injuries sustained by her when she was attacked in the building elevator by a mental patient who was receiving medical treatment at an entity that was another tenant in the building. A judgment is entered on a jury verdict for the employee and the landlord appealed. The verdict was upheld by the Court of Appeals and a leave to appeal to the Michigan Supreme Court was granted. During discovery, it had been revealed that the landlord had received numerous inquiries from other tenants in the building regarding the fact that up to 25 mental patients per day would visit the tenant clinic, which included patients from the Traverse City Hospital and from the Ionia State Prison. The court considered that because the other tenants of the building had voiced their concern over the use of the elevators and stairwells by mental patients to the landlord, the possibility of one of these patients committing a criminal act was foreseeable, at least to the tenants. In its defense, the defendant argued that an incident such as this had never occurred in this building. This testimony was supported by testimony from the director of the clinic, who testified this was the first incident of this type that he was aware of in the history of the program. The court, however, chose to ignore defendant's notice argument, indicating it believed the argument was more directed toward the reasonableness of the risk involved and not its foreseeability. The court further ruled that the existence of the relationship between the landlord and its tenants and invitees placed the duty upon the landlord to protect those tenants and invitees from an unreasonable risk of physical harm. Furthermore, the court ruled that the type of incident giving rise to this claim was foreseeable to the landlord and that the court believed the magnitude of risk to be substantial. In sum, the court ruled that whether the landlord exercised reasonable care under the circumstances of this case was a question for the jury, and it further found no error in admitting testimony that the mental patient who had attacked and stabbed the plaintiff had stabbed another individual on a previous occasion. The court also found that it was the responsibility of the landlord to ensure that the common areas of the building were kept reasonably safe for the use of tenants and invitees. So, under Samson, the court held the landlord had specific duties to protect its invitees and tenants. Further, the court believed that third-party criminal activities could be foreseeable. Eisner v. Lafayette Towers followed Samson and involved an action brought against the landlord of a building by an invitee who was robbed and sexually assaulted in the building's parking lot. The landlord was granted summary disposition and plaintiff appealed. The Court of Appeals, following the holding of Samson, held that a landlord owes a duty to its tenants to protect them from unreasonable risks of harm resulting from the foreseeable criminal acts of third parties within the common areas of the premises. In this case, the Court of Appeals indicated that its review of the evidence provided, both in support and opposition to the appeal, left numerous unanswered questions whether, under the circumstances of the case, the landlord might have had a duty to take some sort of protective action regarding invitees, as well as whether the type of injury such as that suffered by plaintiff was foreseeable. The court therefore reversed the summary judgment entered by the trial court and remanded the case. There is no record showing that the case was ever resubmitted for appeal, so it likely settled. The significance of this case is that it affirms the belief held by the Supreme Court in Sampson that the criminal acts of third parties might be foreseeable. In Williams v. Cunningham Drugstores, Inc., plaintiff was a business invitee shopping at defendant's drugstore when an armed robbery took place. For some unknown reason, during the ensuing confusion, plaintiff followed the robber out of the store and the robber turned and shot him. Williams filed a complaint against the store, alleging that it had breached its duty to exercise reasonable care for plaintiff's safety. Specifically, Williams alleged that defendant had failed to provide armed, visible security guards. At the close of plaintiff's proofs, defendant moved for a directed verdict based upon the fact that defendant did not have a duty to protect invitees from the unforeseeable acts of third parties. The motion was granted and plaintiff appealed. 
The Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the trial court, holding that, as a matter of law, defendant's duty of reasonable care did not extend, providing the degree of protection plaintiff claimed was required. The Michigan Supreme Court granted plaintiff leave to appeal and affirmed that, as a matter of law, while the merchant does owe a duty of reasonable care to its invitees, this duty does not extend to providing armed, visible security guards to protect customers from the criminal acts of third parties. The rationale of the court was based upon public policy concerns, in that it should not be expected that merchants should have to assume the responsibility of providing police protection on their premises. This holding signaled a shift by the Michigan Supreme Court in limiting the duties of merchants to their invitees, and, while the court limited its holding to security guards, it hinted that merchants should not be expected to assume police powers. Holland v. Liddell, which followed Williams, involved an action brought against the landlord by a tenant who was abducted from the apartment building's parking garage. Plaintiff alleged that, while the parking garage had a card key entry system and surveillance cameras, the landlord failed to provide reasonable security for the tenants of the apartment complex, specifically that defendant failed to provide a security guard. Defendant moved for summary disposition, which was denied by the court, as was defendant's motion for directed verdict. Citing Williams, the court noted that the landowners have an affirmative duty to protect their invitees while on the landowner's property. The court held, however, that the landlord is only obligated to use reasonable care for the protection of the invitee and should not be held to be the absolute insurer of the invitee's safety. The court also noted, however, following the Eisner and Sampson line of cases, that a landlord does have a duty to protect its tenants from the foreseeable criminal acts of third parties while the tenants are in the common areas of the landlord's property. So, while the court somewhat watered down the duties owed to tenants by their landlord, it still indicated that third-party crime could not only be foreseeable, but that whether the third-party criminal activity would be foreseeable under the circumstances of this case was a question of fact for the jury and could not be decided by the court as a matter of law. Finally, citing Williams, the court noted that the duty of reasonable care a merchant owes its customer does not extend to providing armed security guards. However, the court passed on deciding whether the reasoning of Williams would also apply in landlord-tenant cases as opposed to only in merchant-invitee cases. Instead, it decided that, based upon the conflicting facts and testimonies surrounding the assault of Ms. Holland, issues of fact would have precluded the granting of a motion for summary disposition, as well as the motion for directed verdict. More disturbing in the holding, however, was the court's opinion that, while a landlord may have no duty to provide parking lot security guards, if it voluntarily assumed that duty, a cause of action could arguably exist if the landlord was then negligent in performing this assumed duty. In this case, evidence had surfaced that the landlord had, at one time, hired a security guard, but, when the guard died, had substituted the surveillance camera instead. Interestingly, the Court of Appeals cited its holding in Scott v. Harper Recreation, Inc. in support of this theory. The Michigan Supreme Court, however, reversed the holding of the Court of Appeals in Scott that same year in the next case. In Scott v. Harper Recreation, Inc., an unidentified gunman shot plaintiff in Defendant Harpo's parking lot. At issue in the case was the fact that the Defendant Nightclub had advertised that it had a lit and guarded parking lot. Plaintiff claimed that he relied upon the assertions of the landlord that the parking lot was secure as a basis for his patronage. Further, plaintiff alleged that, because defendant had issued the advertisements regarding the secure parking lot, it had assumed the responsibility to provide a secure area to its patrons. The circuit court granted summary disposition for defendant, and plaintiff appealed. The Court of Appeals reversed, following its line of reasoning set forth in Holland, which we just discussed, and remanded the case, basing its opinion on the fact that, by virtue of advertising a safe and secure parking lot, defendant had assumed a duty that it would not ordinarily have had, and that this therefore created issues of fact that would preclude granting a motion for summary disposition. Defendant appealed this ruling, and the Michigan Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals, basing its ruling in part on its holding in Williams. 
The Supreme Court noted that, in this case, plaintiffs sought to avoid the rule of Williams by relying upon the principle that the person who voluntarily undertakes a responsibility can be held liable if the responsibility undertaken is performed negligently. The court specifically held that it rejected the notion that a merchant who makes its property visibly safer has increased the risk of harm by causing people to be less anxious. It also held that, by virtue of the fact that merchants are not ordinarily responsible for the criminal acts of third parties, liability may not be imposed on a merchant who, in good faith effort to prevent crime, fails to prevent all crime, nor may suit be brought on the theory that the safety measures taken are less effective than they could or should have been. This holding signals an easing of the expectations of property owners, at least as far as merchants are concerned. In Stanley v. Town Square Cooperative, an invitee brought an action against the property management company when she was robbed and assaulted in the parking lot of the complex. Plaintiff alleged that the management company and apartment cooperative association had breached their duty to keep the common areas of their cooperative reasonably safe. Defendant filed a motion for summary disposition, which was granted by the trial court. Plaintiff appealed, and the Court of Appeals affirmed the holding of the trial court. The Court of Appeals held that the landlord did have a duty to protect tenants and their guests from foreseeable criminal activities in common areas on the premises because the landlord possessed exclusive control over these common areas. The Court further held that, while the landlord also has a duty to take reasonable measures to protect its invitees from conditions on the land created by the landlord, which present an unusual risk of criminal attack, the landlord did not have a duty to make its premises safer than the surrounding community. Again, while still imposing some duty based upon the belief that at least some crime is foreseeable, the court was beginning to chip away at the amount and type of duties owed. In Mason v. Royal De Quinder, Inc., plaintiff and three friends were patrons at a bar. One of the plaintiff's friends got into an altercation with an individual with whom he was familiar. Employees of the bar broke the fight up and ejected the person who had attacked plaintiff's friend, instructing the others to wait inside until the attacking individual had left the premises. At a later point, plaintiff emerged into the parking lot where he was confronted by his friend's assailant, who then assaulted plaintiff. Plaintiff sued the bar on both dram shop and premises liability theories. At the close of plaintiff's proofs, the trial court granted defendant's motion for directed verdict on the dram shop claim, but denied the motion on the premises liability claim. Defendant appealed and the Court of Appeals reversed, citing both Williams and Scott. Specifically, the Court of Appeals held that, while landowners do have a special relationship with invitees, they are not the total insurers of their invitees' safety and do not have a duty to protect invitees from unforeseeable, unreasonable risks. However, the court also held that it believed that merchants did have a duty to use reasonable care to protect identifiable invitees from the foreseeable criminal acts of third parties, and further, that they must use reasonable measures to do so. While the court did not find that defendant in this specific case had a duty to take reasonable measures to protect plaintiff, this holding obviously raised the bar for landowners regarding the criminal acts of third parties. This holding, however, was to be short-lived. In Crass v. Tri-County Security, a case handled by our firm, plaintiff was shot and killed in defendant's parking lot after he had parked in an area where a security company employee employed by the venue had directed him to park. Plaintiff sued both the landlord and the security company. However, because the landlord was in bankruptcy, that portion of the litigation was stayed. The security company filed a motion for summary disposition seeking to strike plaintiff's claims that defendants had failed to properly protect plaintiff or to control the premises. The court granted the motion, finding that the security company owed no duty to plaintiff to protect him from the criminal acts of third parties. Plaintiff appealed, and the Court of Appeals, following the line of cases stemming from Williams, likened this matter to the Scott case discussed previously where the plaintiff had attempted to avoid the holding in Williams that merchants are not ordinarily responsible for the criminal acts of third parties, simply by alleging that the landowner or merchants had assumed a duty and negligently performed it. Accordingly, the Court of Appeals affirmed the holding of the trial court and the case was dismissed. 
In McDonald v. PKT, Inc., a significant Supreme Court case handled both at the trial and appellate levels by our firm, a spectator at a concert held at Pine Knob Theater brought suit against the owner of the property for injuries allegedly received during a sod-throwing incident at the venue. Plaintiff filed suit alleging that defendant was negligent in failing to provide proper security to protect her from the type of injury she suffered. Defendant moved for summary disposition, arguing that it did not have a duty to protect invitees from the criminal acts of third parties. The trial court granted defendant's motion and plaintiff appealed. The Court of Appeals reversed the trial court, holding that it believed there were issues of fact as to whether the sod-throwing incident created a foreseeable risk of harm, and further, whether the security measures taken by defendant were reasonable under the circumstances. Defendant then appealed, and the Michigan Supreme Court granted its application. In an opinion that overruled its prior holding in Mason v. Royal de Quinder, which I discussed a moment ago, the court held that, quote, Subjecting a merchant to liability solely on the basis of a foreseeability analysis is misbegotten. Because criminal activity is irrational and unpredictable, it is in this sense invariably foreseeable everywhere. However, even police, who are specially trained and equipped to anticipate and deal with crime, are unfortunately unable to universally prevent it. This is a testament to the arbitrary nature of crime. Given these realities, it is unjustifiable to make merchants, who not only have much less experience than the police in dealing with criminal activity, but who are also without a community deputation to do so, effectively vicariously liable for the criminal acts of third parties. Close quote. Based upon this analysis, the court held that a merchant has no general obligation to anticipate and prevent criminal acts against invitees, and its only duty to respond is to make reasonable efforts to contact the police. In support of this, the court relied upon its prior holdings in Williams and Scott. Significantly, in overruling Mason v. Royal de Quinder, the court held that it is only present activity on the premises and not any past incidents that create a duty to respond to a risk of imminent harm to invitees by the criminal acts of third parties. In essence, the court held that, because of the irrational and unforeseeable nature of third-party crime, simply because criminal acts had occurred on the premises on a previous occasion does not give rise to notice of potential future criminal acts. This holding severely gutted the significant duties previously owed by merchants to their invitees in cases such as Samson, because it essentially held that crime, by its very nature, was not generally considered foreseeable, and no duty could therefore arise. Under this case, the only duty of a merchant is to reasonably summon the police when given notice that a crime has occurred. Trestane v. Occidental Development, a case which I personally handled, involved a woman who was assaulted and robbed in the parking lot of an apartment building where she had gone to visit her boyfriend who lived there. Plaintiff argued that McDonald and the prior cases concerning the duties owed invitees relating to third-party crime applied only to merchants and not to other types of landowners. Our argument was that, while it was true that in most of the prior cases the defendants had been merchants of one sort or another, for example, a drugstore, a concert venue, a club, or a bar, those cases had also discussed duties owed by landowners, albeit in more general terms. We additionally argued that a comparison of the duties owed invitees by landowners versus those owed by merchants found them to be identical. We argued that McDonald should therefore equally apply to property owners in general. The trial court agreed, granting our motion for summary disposition. Plaintiff appealed to the Michigan Court of Appeals, but the trial court ruling was upheld in an unpublished opinion, and no further appeal was pursued. In Ridley v. Thompson Towers Limited, which was yet another case handled by our firm, plaintiff, a tenant at defendant's premises, brought suit after she was beaten with a golf club in the lobby of the apartment building by her former boyfriend. Plaintiff had told the apartment complex that she did not wish for the boyfriend to be allowed into the building. Defendant's employee saw the boyfriend in the lobby of the building and told him that plaintiff did not want to see him anymore. Shortly after the exchange, plaintiff appeared in the lobby whereupon her boyfriend began beating her with a golf club. Defendant's employee immediately called the police. Defendant filed a motion for summary disposition based upon no breach of duty, which the trial court denied. Defendant appealed. <laughs> 
While the Court of Appeals reversed the trial court, it did so without addressing defendants' contention that the holding in McDonald would apply equally to landlords. Instead, the Court of Appeals focused solely on the particular facts of the case, holding that there was no proximate cause because the attack on plaintiff was unforeseeable to defendant, and defendant responded appropriately by promptly calling the police. In Graves v. Warner Brothers, a very public case, defendants, the Jenny Jones talk show and Warner Brothers, the show's producer, appealed a judgment of almost $30 million entered in favor of plaintiff's personal representatives by the Oakland County Circuit Court. The personal representatives of plaintiff Scott Amador had brought an action against defendants after Amador was killed after being a guest on the Jenny Jones talk show. Amador had revealed on the show that he had a homosexual crush on the man who ultimately killed him. Defendant's motion for summary disposition on the issue of duty was denied by the trial court and the jury found in favor of the personal representatives. The appellate court reversed and held that defendants did not owe a duty to the decedent. The appellate court noted that, in general, there was no legal duty obligating one person to aid or protect another. Moreover, an individual had no duty to protect another from the criminal acts of a third party in the absence of a special relationship between the defendant and the plaintiff or the defendant and the third party. The appellate court held that there was no special relationship between defendants and Amador that warranted the imposition of a duty. Any relationship defendants had with the decedent by inviting him to be on the show ended when the decedent left the show. The judgment of the trial court was vacated and the matter was remanded to the trial court with directions that it entered judgment in favor of defendants. The significance of this ruling is that it essentially held that duty is limited to reasonably responding to situations that occur on the premises and which pose a risk of imminent and foreseeable harm to identifiable invitees, and the duty to respond is limited to contacting the police. The duty does not continue after the merchant-invitee relationship ends. Benton v. Briggs held that the fact that a property owner slash landlord had an allegedly defective exterior door on one of its apartments was not a foreseeable cause of the death of a tenant who was shot through that door while trying to hold it closed against an intruder. Based on the circumstances of the case, to include the fact that the decedent had opened the door and then tried to close it when he saw the intruder had a gun, there was insufficient evidence to show that had there been a more substantial door with a stronger lock, the tenant would not have been killed. In Smith v. Smith, the court held that the property owner slash landlord was not negligent in hiring an employee with a criminal history who subsequently killed a tenant during a personal sexual encounter because the killing took place outside of the employee's scheduled work hours. Furthermore, the court held that the sexual relationship between the employee and the decedent was clearly outside of the course and scope of the employee's job, and the tragic outcome was therefore not a foreseeable consequence of any negligent conduct by the property owner or landlord. In Zygo v. Hurley Medical Center, plaintiffs sued Hurley Hospital, alleging that she was sexually assaulted by a hospital employee while she was in the emergency room suffering a manic depressive episode. Motions for summary disposition and a directed verdict were denied, and a jury awarded plaintiff over $1.1 million. The hospital appealed, and the Court of Appeals reversed, holding that the hospital should have been granted either summary disposition or a directed verdict. Specifically, the appellate court held that, under the doctrine of respondeat superior, the general rule is that an employer is not liable for the torts intentionally or recklessly committed by an employee when those torts are beyond the scope of the employer's business. Plaintiff appealed to the Michigan Supreme Court. The Supreme Court partially reversed the Court of Appeals, noting that it did not agree that there was an exception to the general lack of employer liability for cases where a plaintiff showed that he or she relied on the apparent authority of the employee or that the employee was aided in harming the plaintiff by the existence of the agency relationship between the employee and the employer. The Supreme Court noted that such an exception would potentially subject employers to strict liability for the crimes of their employees. Because the court declined to adopt this exception, plaintiff in this case failed to establish that the hospital was vicariously liable for the sexual misconduct of its employee, who was clearly not acting within the scope of his employment when he engaged in acts of sexual misconduct with the patient. 
Therefore, the generally recognized exception to the respondeat superior rule of employer liability found in one restatement agency second, under which an employer would be liable for the torts of an employee acting outside the scope of his or her employment when the employee is aided in accomplishing the tort by the existence of the agency relation is not adopted in the state of Michigan. In Vela's v. Dollar Tree stores, the court held that Dollar Tree owed no duty to a customer assaulted by another customer except to make reasonable efforts to contact the police, even though Dollar Tree had its own security personnel in the store. Lamar v. Ramada Franchise Systems, Inc. involved a fight between two guests of the hotel on New Year's Eve. Allegedly, the two combatants had argued earlier in the evening at one of the several parties that had been booked at the hotel. The two individuals later ran into each other when one of them was riding an elevator that stopped at a floor where the other one was waiting, and a fight ensued. The issue was whether, because of the earlier altercation between the two individuals, the hotel should have been on notice that authorities should have been summoned earlier. The Court of Appeals held that the reasonableness of defendants' efforts to contact the police should be decided by the jury and not the court. This case is distinguishable, however, because there was a factual dispute as to how long defendant had known a fight had been going on at its hotel before it called the police, which related to whether defendant's response to the fight was reasonable or not. As you can see by now, the reasonableness of the response to a criminal activity is the critical factor in determining whether a merchant or landlord has any liability. In Brown v. Brown, plaintiff was a security guard employed by an independent security company who was contracted to work at defendant Samuel Witter Steel, Inc. An employee of Samuel Witter Steel raped the security guard at the corporation's facility. The employee had no prior criminal record, no history of violent behavior, and no history indicating that he harbored a propensity to commit rape. However, the security guard alleged that the employee routinely made sexually explicit comments to her. That issue was whether the corporation's knowledge of such comments created a basis for holding the corporation liable for the rape. The case was dismissed by the trial court on motion, based upon no liability for the independent criminal act. Plaintiff appealed and the Court of Appeals reversed the dismissal, noting that an issue of fact existed as to whether Samuel Witter should have known of its employees' propensities. Defendant Samuel Witter appealed to the Michigan Supreme Court which reversed the appellate court and reinstated the trial court's dismissal. Specifically, the Supreme Court held that, where an employee had no prior criminal record or history of violent behavior indicating a propensity to rape, the corporation, his employer, was not liable solely on the basis of the employee's lewd comments for a rape perpetrated by that employee when those comments failed to convey an unmistakable particularized threat of rape. Because the employee did not commit prior acts that would have put the corporation on notice of his propensity to commit rape, and his workplace speech was not predictive of his criminal act, the corporation could not be held liable. Note, however, that if an employer does have knowledge of past acts of impropriety, violence, or disorder on the part of the employee, that knowledge is generally considered sufficient to potentially place the employer on notice of the employee's violent propensities. This is citing a case called Hirsch v. Kentfield Builders, Inc. In Bailey v. Schaff, a resident of defendant apartment complex, Laura Green, told two contract security guards employed by the complex named Baker and Campbell that there was a man on the premises with a gun. She told them that he was waving the gun and threatening to shoot the guests at a party and asserted later that she pointed to the area of the gathering and identified the man with the gun. Despite Green's warning, Baker and Campbell chose not to investigate the situation. Instead, they chose to drive an unrelated intoxicated resident back to his apartment. Approximately 10 or 15 minutes after they dropped off the intoxicated resident, Baker and Campbell heard two gunshots. They drove back to the gathering where they observed a man, later identified as Plaintiff Bailey, lying face down with two gunshot wounds in his upper back. Bailey suffered severe injuries, including a spinal cord injury and paraplegia. Bailey sued, alleging that defendants were liable for the shooting under theories of negligence, premises liability, and vicarious liability. The Genesee County Circuit Court dismissed plaintiff's claims against the owner and manager of the apartment complex on motion, and plaintiff appealed. 
The Court of Appeals held that the trial court did not err to the extent that it dismissed the claims premised on any duty of defendants to provide security or otherwise make the premises safe from criminal activity. However, it ruled that the trial court erred to the extent that it determined that plaintiff did not state a claim that defendants failed to respond properly through their agents to the imminent threat that a shooter posed. The court held that defendants had a duty to call the police once they had knowledge of an ongoing emergency that posed a foreseeable risk of imminent harm to an identifiable invitee or class of invitees. A premises possessor had a duty to take reasonable measures in response to an ongoing situation that was occurring on the premises, which meant expediting the involvement of or reasonably attempting to notify the police when they were first given notice that there was a man with a gun threatening harm to people on the property. The message here is that a landlord owes a duty to both tenants and their guests to take reasonable measures within a reasonable period of time in response to ongoing crime taking place on the premises. While this generally only means calling the police and landlords and their agents are not expected to fight crime themselves, the response itself must be timely. This case is also important in reinforcing the fact that landlords are under no duty to provide security services for their properties and, If security services have been provided, it does not create a duty for those security services to prevent crime. However, you have to note that a landlord will be held responsible if the security services it has hired, who are considered contract employees, fail to timely notify police to an ongoing crime on the property. In Zaremski Cole v. Bedrock Management Services, plaintiff was attacked in the lobby of the building where she worked by a woman named Carolyn Winfrey. Winfrey had attacked another employee working in that building about three months earlier. Defendant owned the building and provided security services through a contractor, Guardsmark LLC. Plaintiff filed a premises liability action against defendant alleging that it had breached a duty of care owed to her by virtue of her status as a tenant in the building. Defendant moved for summary disposition, arguing that it did not have a duty to anticipate, prevent, or protect against the criminal acts of third parties perpetrated against an unidentified person, even if there had been a similar attack against another person in the past. Defendant argued that it had fulfilled the duty owed to plaintiff because the police were called when plaintiff was attacked. In other words, after she had been identified as a potential victim. Plaintiff argued the defendant owed a heightened duty to maintain the common areas of the building so that it was reasonably safe for its tenants because it should have known that Winfrey posed a foreseeable risk of harm to anyone in her vicinity. The trial court agreed with defendant's position, dismissing the case, and plaintiff appealed. The Court of Appeals noted that the factual evidence submitted was that a security guard saw Winfrey enter the building and walk over to look at the building directory. The guard approached Winfrey and asked if she needed assistance. After a short, uneventful exchange, the guard returned to his desk and Winfrey continued to look at the directory. Shortly thereafter, the guard heard a woman scream. He then saw plaintiff lying on the lobby floor near Winfrey, who had been disarmed of a kitchen knife, and a bystander was lying on top of Winfrey. Plaintiff told police officers that she had been walking in the lobby area and that Winfrey approached her and lunged at her with the knife. There is no evidence suggesting that plaintiff and Winfrey shared any connection before the assault. The parties did not dispute that Winfrey was arrested about three months earlier for assaulting another individual who worked in plaintiff's building. The court noted, however, that the record was bare of any evidence that this prior assault was in any way related to the assault on plaintiff, and there was no relationship, through work or otherwise, between plaintiff and the prior victim, and therefore there was no heightened duty created. Under the holding in Bailey discussed previously, Defendant's duty of care to plaintiff would therefore have been triggered only after defendant had notice of a specific situation occurring on the premises that would cause a reasonable person to recognize a risk of imminent harm to an identifiable invitee. In this case, the record revealed that no reasonable risk of imminent harm to plaintiff was apparent until Winfrey attacked plaintiff and the court therefore held that defendant didn't owe plaintiff a duty of care until the time of the attack and that it then satisfied the limited standard of care to respond by timely notifying the police. As demonstrated in a state of Sherita M. Williams versus Consuela Lewis and Advanced Security, an unpublished Court of Appeals case, despite Michigan's established line of case law addressing third-party crime on 
defendant's premises, plaintiffs continue to pursue these types of claims. Often plaintiffs argue, most recently in this case, that defendant had a duty to protect plaintiff because of certain circumstances individual to that particular case, creating a quote-unquote special relationship. The case arose from a workplace murder-suicide that took place at a Detroit area medical clinic operated by Park Family Healthcare PC. Myron Williams, a maintenance man at Park, entered the clinic on the morning of April 9, 2013 and fatally shot plaintiff's decedent, Sherita Williams, who was also an employee of Park, before setting the building on fire and taking his own life. Defendant Consuela Lewis was on duty that morning, working as an unarmed security guard for Advanced Security, the company with which Park had contracted to provide security services at the clinic. Williams had been romantically involved with Myron, her co-worker, for about a year when Williams discovered that Myron, a married man, had no plans to leave his wife. The fact that Sharita and Myron had the same last name in this case, I should say, is simply coincidental. After Sharita ended the relationship, Myron began harassing her and her new boyfriend with telephone calls and over social media. Sharita also complained that Myron was stalking her and threatening her and her children with physical violence. Sharita told this to several co-workers, including the security guard Lewis, as well as that she suspected Myron of breaking into her home and stealing her van, an incident which occurred a month before the shooting and which prompted Williams to relocate. Sharita reported Myron's threats to the police on multiple occasions and, only six days before the shooting, Sharita obtained a personal protection order against Myron. Defendant Lewis knew about all this as Sharita asked Lewis to serve the, the personal protection order on Myron. Lewis, however, declined to do that. Defendants moved for summary disposition, arguing that they could not be found liable because Myron's act was unforeseeable and they had no duty to protect Williams against Myron's unforeseeable criminal acts. Plaintiff, however, argued that a special relationship had been created because Lewis was aware that Williams had obtained a PPO against Myron and that Lewis therefore had a duty to call 911 or alert someone that Myron had entered the clinic while Sharita was inside. The trial court denied defendant's motion after determining that questions of fact remained regarding the foreseeability of Myron's criminal acts and whether there was a duty for Lewis to protect Sharita. The fact that plaintiff had told defendant Lewis, a security guard working for defendant advanced security at plaintiff's workplace, that plaintiff's ex-boyfriend, a co-worker, was stalking her and threatening violence, did not create a special relationship and defendants had no legal duty to take any action to warn plaintiff or prevent a crime, plaintiff's murder by the ex-boyfriend, that the court believed defendants could not reasonably foresee. The most recent ruling on independent criminal acts is in Emanuel v. Days Inn of Port Huron, an unpublished opinion issued December 18, 2018. In Emanuel, plaintiff received a call from his then-girlfriend, Christina Rennie, asking him to pick her up from the Days Inn Hotel where she was using drugs with her friend Shane Ward. Plaintiff drove to the hotel and spoke with Rennie alone outside the hotel room. Plaintiff testified that he could see the suspected drug paraphernalia inside the room. He knew Ward was in the room, but he did not speak with Ward at the time. In an effort to defuse the situation, Rennie asked Plaintiff to wait in the hotel lobby while she gathered her things. Plaintiff testified that he went to the lobby and informed the receptionist that she needed to call the police or do something about it. The receptionist declined to call the police. Roughly 10 to 15 minutes later, Ward appeared in the lobby and threw a drink in Plaintiff's face, knocked him to the ground, and began kicking him violently. Plaintiff sustained a fractured tibia and kneecap as a result. Plaintiff filed suit against Ward, Days Inn of Port Huron, and Port Huron Knights for negligence premises liability, and assault and battery. Defendants days in and port here on nights filed motions for summary disposition. Defendants argued that they did not breach any duty of care to plaintiff. In response, plaintiff attached an affidavit claiming that he asked the receptionist to call the police because Ward threatened to attack him. This was in direct conflict to his deposition testimony where he said he asked the receptionist to call police to get them out of the room. Plaintiff claimed that the affidavit was merely meant to clarify the testimony, but that was not the case upon review. The trial court excluded his affidavit from consideration and granted defendants motions for summary disposition. Plaintiff appealed. 
The Michigan Court of Appeals examined long-standing case law pertaining to duties owed by premises owners for criminal activity on the premises. Relying on McDonald v. PKT, Inc., the court held that a hotel receptionist had no duty to protect plaintiff from potential future criminal activity. In order for a duty to arise, there must be an imminent threat of harm. In addition, the court underscored the importance of properly using affidavits to clarify, not contradict, prior deposition testimony. The bottom line as to what the landowner's duty is relating to criminal acts on the premises is that the only duty of landowners and merchants in responding to an independent criminal act in the common areas of their premises is to make reasonable efforts to timely contact the police. I won't be in my office the day this webinar is scheduled to be broadcast, but should anyone have any questions, they should feel free to contact me at either the telephone number or email address on the screen. Thank you.